Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. I've got another little video essay for you guys today. Uh, today it's actually based on a project that I did in university for a class called Women in the Ancient World. And I thought it was really interesting, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. Uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> that's what we're doing today. Uh, so the project is titled Tracking the Betrayal of Cleopatra in Art History or How Propaganda Trends and Eroticism Shaped the Image of Egypt's Most Famous Queen. Uh, I was really interested in answering the questions of how is Cleopatra portrayed, how has that portrayal changed over time, and is that portrayal or are any of those portrayals accurate to who she actually was. So that is the goal of today. That's what we're those are the questions that we have in mind. And with that said, um, let's get into it. So in order to answer our question of whether or not the portrayals of Cleopatra are accurate, we have to first determine who Cleopatra was. So that's going to be our first objective of the video, is to go through the objective history of who Cleopatra was, what happened to her, what did she do, how did her contemporaries view her, what did people think of her while she was alive. The lineage relevant to Cleopatra begins about 250-ish years before she's born something like that. I haven't actually done the math, but basically it is the 300s BCE and Alexander the Great is pressing his empire farther and farther into every corner of the world. It began in Macedon in southern Europe and has expanded across northern Africa, down through Egypt, the Near and Middle East, and into Central Asia, stopping about where modern-day India is. At the age of 25, he has killed the last Persian king of kings and named himself as emperor of the Macedonian Empire, the largest empire to exist in the world at the time. By 323 BCE, at the age of 32, Alexander the Great suddenly falls ill and dies very quickly with no clear reasoning and, most crucially, no named heir or clear line of succession. His only living children are illegitimate and born to the women of the lands that he's conquered, so mostly uh, in Asia, and his only legitimate child is unborn and the sex is yet to be determined. So, of course, if the baby is a girl, she cannot be the new emperor. And we've got to wait a couple months to figure it out. So of course, what follows the death of Alexander the Great is very messy. It's rumored that on his deathbed, Alexander the Great decided that the next ruler should be the strongest. Objectively, one of the worst things you can say if you want the, your empire to have a long lifespan. Um, so of course, mess. A council gathers to try to determine who should be the next emperor, who should be the successor, and of course nobody agrees. Some people are trying to back one of Alexander the Great's illegitimate children, who is an adult, while others are claiming we should wait to see the sex of the baby that has yet to be born. If it is a boy, that seems to be the clear option. But then again, the baby would need a regent, and who is going to be Who's going to step up for that job, huh? And why shouldn't they just be emperor anyway? Rumors spread about poisoning and foul play and murder and conspiracy. And so, of course, nobody trusts anybody else. So only two years after Alexander the Great's death, the empire is plunged into a 40-year period of war, longer than Alexander the Great was alive, and twice as long as his empire was. The empire built by Alexander the Great would never again be united under one ruler, and the result of the war was to divide the empire into different regions. One of the regions was Egypt, and that was given to Ptolemy, who was an advisor and close a consultant and companion of Alexander the Great. He established the Ptolemaic dynasty, so if you've ever been to an, an Egyptian exhibit at a, any museum, um, you've probably seen artifacts that say Ptolemaic dynasty or Ptolemy, um, that's this guy. And as we're about to learn, it is the last dynasty of the Roman pharaohs. I meant the Egyptian pharaohs, 
Cleopatra VII Thea Philopator was born in 69 BCE to the Ptolemaic dynasty, which at this point had been in power in Egypt for about 200 years. She was said to be very intelligent, speaking nine languages, including Egyptian, making her the first Ptolemaic ruler to bother learning the language of the land they occupied. After the death of her father when she was a teenager, Cleopatra was married to her younger brother, as was common of the Egyptian rulers, and his name was Ptolemy XIII. He was about 10 years old compared to Cleopatra's 18, so naturally she was to act as a kind of co-ruler, regent. It wasn't a great arrangement, nor a really long-lasting arrangement, as the supporters of Ptolemy XIII orchestrated a coup to force Cleopatra out of Alexandria to flee Egypt, but she wasn't going down without a fight. She ran to the most powerful man that she could, Julius Caesar. It is said that Cleopatra delivered herself to Caesar by rolling herself up in a carpet and having the slaves bring her into his chambers. Other translations actually say that this would have been more like a laundry cart or a laundry bin, but as we're gonna see, the artists prefer the carpet. But this charmed Caesar, who was taken with her brazenness and her confidence, and so the two of them began an affair. He was 31 years older than her, she was 21 and he was 52. But it should be noted that this was a favorable arrangement for both of them. Cleopatra could win back Egypt with Caesar's help and with his army, and Caesar would have a lifetime ally with one of the richest women in the world and the ruler of an extremely wealthy and powerful kingdom. Rome was also in the middle of the civil war at this time, called Caesar's Civil War, and that brought Caesar to Egyptian territory as he was chasing his enemy Pompey. Of course, when he arrived in Egypt, Egypt presented him with Pompey's head. And since he was already in the area, Caesar agreed to help out with the conflict between Cleopatra and Ptolemy. He tried to make peace between them, but Ptolemy, or more likely his supporters, since he was still a very young child at this point, claimed that Caesar was writing terms that favored Cleopatra over Ptolemy. Which might have been true, since Cleopatra was carrying his child. In response to this, Ptolemy laid siege to Cleopatra and Caesar, but ultimately died by drowning while escaping the battlefield when Caesar's troops came in for backup. Cleopatra's half-sister Arsinoe was the only remaining threat to her rule, and for her part in aiding Ptolemy against Cleopatra, Arsinoe was exiled to Rome, where she was brought to the temple of Artemis to be made a priestess. Uh, however, even though Arsinoe was very far away from Egypt and far away from Cleopatra, she would remain to be a source of paranoia for many years. And so as such, this is not the last we'll hear of Arsinoe. Cleopatra was then married to her other brother, Ptolemy XIV, and they were named joint rulers. However, she and Caesar would continue their affair, which at this point had already produced one son, also named Ptolemy, but nicknamed Caesarian, meaning Little Caesar. On March 15th, 44 BCE, Julius Caesar was assassinated by his Senate. Shortly after, Ptolemy XIV was also killed, some say by poisoning by Cleopatra, who was very quick to put her own son as her new joint ruler. Cleopatra was able to remain the queen by using her son as kind of a proxy. So he was technically the ruler, but she was his regent. She was meant to rule until he was old enough to rule, and which meant that she was in charge. As all this was happening, war was once again breaking out in Rome. Cleopatra would side with the Roman Second Triumvirate in the Liberator Civil War, which started based on, you know, after Julius Caesar got assassinated. Uh, and this was a side formed by Caesar's grandnephew, Octavian, Marcus Lepidus, and Mark Antony. After meeting, Cleopatra and Mark Antony would famously strike up an affair, and Mark Antony would find himself relying more and more on Cleopatra's financial help to finance and aid his invasions in the Parthian Empire and the Kingdom of Armenia. 
it said that Antony was instantly taken with Cleopatra, so much so that he was willing to do her dirty work for her. And so when she wants to get rid of the only person who might remain to be a threat to her rule, Mark Antony was quick to dispatch an assassin to kill Arsinoe in the Temple of Artemis. She would have been about 21 when this happened, if we go based off of the Encyclopedia Britannica's birth year for her, which would have made her about 15 when she was exiled. Antony and Cleopatra would have three children together, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene II, who were twins, which is adorable because Helios and Selene are the sun and the moon so precious uh, and their last child was uh, named Ptolemy. <laughs> they and Caesarion would be declared rulers over various territories which started to be a point of tension with Rome. Um, so when we're trying to talk about what Cleopatra actually looked like we're going to look at the primary sources from her time period and um, it's difficult there aren't a whole lot of reliable sources we do know that her family was macedonian greek in origin not egyptian uh, and we also know that her family heavily heavily inbred including brother sister marriages and children born to brother sister marriages which might have affected the way that she looked cassius dio says she's beautiful but plutarch says that she's not and that her real beauty comes from her intellect and the way that she speaks so even within the contemporary writers we're not really clear what she looked like it is important to note that plutarch was writing about a century after cleopatra had died and cassius dio was writing even longer after she died about two centuries after so their sources might not have been the strongest um certainly by cassius dio's time there was nobody alive who had ever met cleopatra directly so even though these are relatively contemporary sources they aren't primary sources these people were not there and likely heard the stories through already secondary accounts which have probably been influenced as we're about to see in the next little section by the propaganda that was being spread against Cleopatra. Another Roman source on Cleopatra was the poet Horace who wrote a pretty scathing poem against Cleopatra or really to Cleopatra, an ode to Cleopatra, uh, also about a century after she had died. Uh, he calls her a deadly monster and celebrates her death, even though by the end of it he does acknowledge her bravery. And I really think this is proof that the propaganda, which again we're going to see in the next section, the propaganda against Cleopatra was extremely effective, not only while she was alive, but it really just like took root in the Roman consciousness and affected the way that they viewed her forever. And just to address the elephant in the room, yes, all of these sources are Roman, um, and that is largely because a lot of the Egyptian sources from the time were have been lost um, in the first burning of the Library of Alexandria, which did happen during the Civil War, um, Julius Caesar's boats were on fire and then the fire transferred to the library so a lot of records were lost and then the library of alexandria burned down a second time a couple centuries later and the majority of the sources were lost so most contemporary egyptian records of cleopatra how her people viewed her um have unfortunately been destroyed and not a whole lot survives of that time period. So that is why we're primarily using Roman sources. Now there are some coins in her likeness, but those stylize her to look very Roman, to wear the Roman styles and have Roman features. And I did actually my research project in university over Roman coins and I can tell you that the way that the figure on the coin looks is not necessarily accurate to what the person looked. It's it's not it's not about the way that the person looks, it's about representing them as this like perfect Roman ruler. Roman coins weren't really about depicting the person accurately, it was about depicting them as the ruler. So they would be associated with certain gods who had certain qualities, they would wear certain styles, they would look a certain way, because that's what people expected the Roman rulers to look like. So they're really not a good source for, you know, how did this person look 
it's it's what the people wanted to see, what they expected to see, not accurate, not actually accurate to, to their likeness. Um, but in these coins, she 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 looks she looks hot. She doesn't look great. Uh, the coins are used often as a source for people to say that Cleopatra was not very pretty because they're very plain looking. Um, this one article from World Archaeology says. Cleopatra was no beauty. Coins shows. So typo in the title is not great, um, but it features this line. However, it seems that the image of Cleopatra as a beautiful seductress is largely a more recent concoction, uh, and as we are about to discover, that is not even a little bit true. The Civil War in Rome ends. Brutus is dead. All the people who assassinated Caesar are dead, and the Roman Second Triumvirate is fracturing over who should be the new ruler of Rome, who should be installed as the new ruler. Uh, and now the tension is between Caesar's grandnephew Octavian and Mark Antony. The first stage of their war is a propaganda war, and one that would have consequences that lasted much, much longer than the Roman Empire, and certainly much longer than the lifespans of the people involved. In order to turn Mark Antony's supporters and troops against him, Octavian starts spreading propaganda about Mark Antony and Cleopatra. He tells everybody that Cleopatra seduced Mark Antony and that Mark Antony is just a womanizer who can't be trusted to withstand the whims of a woman. The narrative that Cleopatra was a whore was effective because it played into the fears of the patriarchal Roman government and military. She was a woman in power, which was unnatural and went against Roman traditional gender roles. But she also wasn't Roman, and so playing into this and feeding into this, uh, portraying her as an Easterner was an effective way to turn people against her. She was a cultural other. She didn't follow Roman traditional values. She's from the East, where they practice magic and where women are dangerous. The narrative that Mark Antony was a whore was effective because it was probably true. Mark Antony was very popular among the young soldiers because he was always talking to them about women. He was a known womanizer. He'd been married several times and had several more documented mistresses. In fact, at the time he started his affair with Cleopatra, he was married to another woman. And, and beyond that, she was the perfect traditional Roman woman who really upheld Roman values. And her name was Octavia, and she was Octavian's sister. Octavian used this as a rallying cry, as a source of outrage. And to be fair, it was a pretty shitty thing to do, and it probably did really bother the Octavian siblings. Uh, but the message became, look at how Mark Antony can be married to this perfect, pure, traditional, good Roman woman, who is a direct descendant of Julius Caesar, by the way, and still he cheats on her with this Eastern woman, with this foreign woman, who probably practices magic and seduces men by the hundreds and is adept with poisons of the Nile. You know, she probably seduces men, brings them to her bed, and then kills them on the way out to keep them quiet about it. Some sources say that Antony and Cleopatra were married, which would have gone against Roman law, which forbids uh, marriage to foreign women. Uh, this is another detail that Octavian can exploit in order to portray Mark Antony as rejecting Roman values and turning against the Roman people, against the Roman laws. How can he be fit to rule Rome if he's willing to break Roman law? However, this might be something that Octavian made up in order to spread that narrative. Naturally, I would think Octavian wasn't thrilled when Mark Antony cheated on his sister and left her for Cleopatra. 
but I would think he was even less excited when, Octa when Mark Antony claimed that he himself was the rightful ruler of Rome and allied himself with Cleopatra in a bid to oust Octavian. And when you consider that, in addition to the fact that he and Cleopatra are declaring their children as the rightful rulers of different territories and giving the conquered territories to them, it's shaping up to look like Cleopatra and Mark Antony are starting their own dynasty. War broke out pretty soon after that. Octavian was backed by the Roman army and the Senate. Mark Antony was backed by Cleopatra. With the help of Octavian's increasing propaganda, Mark Antony's forces were starting to have their doubts. After all, women weren't allowed in Roman politics, and the idea of a woman, especially a foreign woman, having as much power as Cleopatra had wasn't sitting right with a lot of them. So a lot of them did defect and go support Octavian. But Octavian knew this would happen, this was his goal. And so when he declared war against the budding dynasty, he didn't declare war against Mark Antony, he declared war against Cleopatra. And by doing that, he was condemning her to a higher degree than he was condemning Mark Antony. He was calling her the source of this conflict. She's the reason we can't have peace in Rome. She's the reason that our country is being, you know, divided and that Mark Antony is abandoning his Roman values, abandoning his Roman citizens. It's her fault. This strange foreigner who is a woman. More and more of Mark Antony's forces would abandon his cause and switch to Octavian's side. The war would eventually end in Octavian's victory, and with it, the end of the Roman Republic, the beginning of the Roman Empire. Octavian would declare himself the first emperor of Rome and take on a new title for himself. Caesar Augustus. Antony would commit suicide, followed closely by Cleopatra who decided that suicide was a better option than being taken to Rome for a trial. And if I can be real for a second, I think she was right. The story is that she committed suicide by a snake bite, but more likely it was just regular poison. However, again, the snake is a better story, so that's the one that we're going to see the artist drawn to. The kids were still pretty young. Uh, Cleopatra Selene and Alexander Helios who were 10 and Ptolemy was a bit younger. They were taken to Rome for a triumph and they were met with a lot of sympathy from the crowd. Children typically typically were met with sympathy from the, from the crowd. Um, there was little record of what happened to Ptolemy, but we do know that the twins survived to adulthood. They got married, they continued their family lives, they were fine. Octavian, who was now Augustus, had them put in the care of his sister, Octavia, who I guess would have been like kind of their stepmom as she was married to their dad when he got with their mom. The oldest child and the only child by Julius Caesar, Caesarian, was executed by strangulation. He was 17. This was the beginning of this perception of Cleopatra as a temptress and a horror queen. But looking objectively at the history, I just, it just doesn't seem accurate. So we know how she was viewed by others, by her contemporaries, but it's time to ask the question that I think often gets ignored. How did she view herself? Cleopatra had herself depicted as Isis, the Egyptian goddess of the moon, life, and a protector of women and children. She is the mother goddess who is worshipped for compassion and love and healing and protection, again, of women and children. Not at all the qualities that Octavian would want you to associate with her. This type of depiction wasn't unusual for Egyptian queens, but it was unusual for Ptolemaic queens because, again, Cleopatra is the only one who really embraced Egyptian culture. It was not a hereditary thing. She made an effort to embrace their culture. In most art, she is depicted alongside Caesarion, which kind of makes sense because she is his co-ruler, she is his regent, but I do think it should be considered that being a mother was probably very important to her, something she valued a lot, 
even if it was just a way of preserving her lineage. Something really important that I forgot to point out was in Egypt, pharaohs were viewed as living gods. They were gods on earth. And so one of Cleopatra's names, Thea, comes from the Greek Theos, meaning deity. And so these images of her as Isis aren't really metaphorical. It's not really symbolic. She is a goddess on earth. And so Plutarch writes that she presented herself in public as Isis and was called the new Isis, which may or may not be true, again, since he was writing considerably later than her time period. But I do think this idea can tell us a little bit about herself because just for anybody being treated as a goddess and told that you are a goddess for your entire life will do things to you mentally and so i don't think that she was sleeping with just every man that she could find because she probably thought they were lesser than her she probably thought herself to be way above just the random roman citizens and random egyptian citizens i think it really plays into this fantasy that we see even in the modern day where sexuality and promiscuity are vilified but they're also desired so the idea kind of becomes like oh Cleopatra she'll get with anybody she's so promiscuous she'll sleep with anyone maybe even you and so that's like it's something that causes you to hate her she's promiscuous so you hate her but you also want her and it's this really weird and honestly kind of gross um, dichotomy where this thing that causes you so much anger towards her uh, is also the thing that you desire about her so it's this really like violent uh, but also desired quality again i don't think that she was just sleeping with every man she came across because let's look at the facts from what we know from the documented lovers that she's had these are the qualifications you have to meet in order to be cleopatra's man number one have an empire and i just have trouble believing that a woman portraying herself and likely believing herself to be a goddess because even if she doesn't really believe in the egyptian goddesses i know we talked about how her family wasn't egyptian even if she doesn't believe in the religion being told your entire life, being presented as, being being understood to be a goddess for your entire life, eventually that's going to sound pretty good and you're going to believe it. So I do not think that this woman who only sleeps with emperors and who believes herself to be a god it's gonna be sleeping with just anybody. I think it's a fantasy. I think it's just a fantasy. It's also worth noting that despite Octavian and history portraying her as a temptress, she's only ever been documented to be with two men, both of which were extremely powerful political allies, as well as people with whom she had committed long-term relationships with and children that she treated as legitimate even though their marriage really if they were married would not have been considered to uh, consider legitimate by roman law and that's a lot more than can be said for a lot of people including antony so now that we have the objective facts and we also have how cleopatra was viewed by her contemporaries we can start to get into how she's been depicted through art how similar or different that depiction is to who she actually was and how the depiction is changing over time. So that was a lot of things, but I'll try to put some kind of graphic up on the screen so you can keep track. Just listen, you'll, you'll figure it out. Cleopatra became popular in Europe in the late 15th century and early 16th century, right between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and since then she's been a fairly frequent character in every century following. The Renaissance is associated with reinterpretation of classical art and classical themes, and with that comes the reinterpretation of Egypt. More and more European scholars were doing research and excavation in Egypt, and that was starting to, to trickle into the public sphere of interest. The finding of hieroglyphs and ancient Egyptian art was very new and culturally different to the Europeans, so it was exciting. It caught the attention of a lot of artists, 
especially because Egypt is still viewed at this time, is still viewed as a source of the occult and mysticism. One of the first instances of Cleopatra in the Western mainstream is her appearance in Dante's Inferno, published in 1472. I was confused. The book was widely circulated in 1472, but it was written in 1314 and took place in 1300. So right at the very, very beginning of the Renaissance, 1314, not 1472. Oh my God. Here she appears in the second ring of hell, which is reserved for those who commit the sin of lust. In the story, she is condemned and damned for her sexuality, which kind of reduces her, who she was to a very sexual being. More Renaissance poetry in which Cleopatra appears comes from Chaucer, who famously wrote Canterbury Tales, everybody's favorite high school English book. Uh, Chaucer wrote a series of poems called Legends of Good Women, which is thought to be unfinished because he promises us more legends than he actually delivers. But one of them is Cleopatra, and it's a very, it's a, it has a lot of medieval influence, a lot of like chivalry and knighthood. Uh, so Cleopatra is de depicted as this honorable, noble queen who is lamenting Antony's death, and Antony is her knight in shining armor. Translated for modern English, he writes, the noble queen who so loved this knight for his merits and his chivalry. So he writes of her lamenting Antony's death and cursing herself, and knowing that she will get no forgiveness from Octavian, and so full of grief because of her lost love, Cleopatra decides to kill herself. So there's a lot of very time period specific uh, imagery and concepts here, this idea of chivalry, ideas of knighthood, which obviously didn't exist in ancient Rome. And this is something that we're going to see with more of the Renaissance art, is that the, the artists really situate Cleopatra within their own time period, not within ancient Rome. So values specific to the Renaissance are the values that we see associated with Cleopatra. Even though they're not accurate, these artists are kind of reinterpreted interpreting her as if she was a modern woman. She became a popular figure in Renaissance paintings after this, going through many, many painters and many, many portrayals, and I think she only gets more and more popular as time goes on. The early paintings usually depict her as strictly a Western woman with very little hint of Egyptian styling or clothing. She has pale skin, light hair, light eyes, and she often isn't wearing much jewelry that, or grand clothing that would mark her as a queen or very less as an Egyptian queen. She often looked a bit like Venus, uh, as can be seen through this comparison. Often with flowy hair and very soft features, she's very much depicted in the fashions and the aesthetics of women during the Renaissance, so little attention is paid to historical or cultural accuracy, which is understandable since these painters likely didn't have extreme extensive knowledge about ancient Egypt. It would not be until considerably later that painters start to lean into her Egyptian identity. There is also a lot of fascination with Cleopatra's death in these paintings. She's very often seen almost or completely naked with the asp in her final moments of life. There was an emphasis here on female death and defeat, and what's so interesting is that she rarely looks to be in pain. She's still beautiful and sensual, and there's an element of romance to these paintings of what must have been Cleopatra's worst moments. A little later into the Renaissance, one of the most famous pieces of art about Cleopatra is released, and that is Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. Here, Cleopatra takes on a more romantic role. She is a woman ruled by her emotions and love. She's a tragic hero who dies in a lover's suicide, so moved by grief over her beloved's death. This play does specifically like into the lover's suicide, like the emotions that you feel that losing your loved one drives you to this point, but Historically, it's more likely that the suicides were practical or even cultural. Rome did have a tradition of ritual suicide in order to maintain honor after dishonor 
or in defeat. So Mark Antony, probably what happened is Mark Antony knew he was defeated and commit suicide as a way of retaining his honor or even getting some of that honor back. And Cleopatra really, I can only think of it as being practical, knowing that she is defeated, knowing that Antony is dead, her, her main supporter is dead, and that if she does not do this, she'll be taken to Rome for the triumph. So to summarize, Antony would have killed himself as a way of maintaining honor and status in defeat, and Cleopatra would have killed herself in order to avoid a worse fate at the hands of the Romans. Uh, there was no way they were winning, and they both knew it. So Shakespeare uh, twisting it into a lover's suicide, it's fine for Shakespeare. It's, uh, honestly, I think it's less sad than what actually happened, and it's it's a better story. So I also think it's interesting to note that Shakespeare lived much closer to our time period than he did to Cleopatra's. So even though we kind of see him as an older figure, a historical figure, it was still 1500 years after Cleopatra had died. And that's a really long time. And Shakespeare is already known to kind of play fast and loose with with history that wasn't that long ago for his time period, so you can imagine how little genuine influence he took from historical records. The Renaissance saw Cleopatra very closely associated with romance and love and eroticism, often coinciding with her suicide. A few hundred years later, Edgar Allan Poe would famously say, the death of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world. The Renaissance might agree. Cleopatra remained popular even as art styles changed. With the arrival of the Baroque period, painters start to favor drama and theatricality, exuberance, dynamic movement, and grandeur. This was also around the time we start to see Cleopatra's identity as a queen start to take a little bit more importance, which makes sense since the Baroque period did like to portray richness and excitement and um, surplus. She is still being portrayed as a westerner, often even wearing the styles of western women at the time, but she is starting to be a more commanding presence. Uh, not always because these things aren't totally linear, but we're start that's the direction we're going in. These paintings, both titled The Banquet of Cleopatra, are the best examples of this as they show the excitement and grandness of Cleopatra while still keeping her very Western. She's painted wearing Western styles that were popular in the countries where the painters were from, and there's almost no attention paid to her Egyptian identity or the historical time period outside of like a Roman style column here and there. Her suicide remained to be a major subject for painters during the Baroque period and the scenes were made to be more dramatic, featuring more harsh lighting and dynamic poses. Here are two paintings very similar to the Renaissance paintings of her suicide, but with the difference of adhering to Baroque qualities of drama and lighting. Neoclassicism was a big period for Cleopatra because, as the name would imply, this was a huge movement back to looking at the classics, so Greek and Roman subjects were being painted and written about a lot. And we're starting to see even more of Cleopatra's Egyptianness starting to show up in art. And she started to veer away from the strictly Western portrayal we've seen at her. This period of art has more of an interest in history, so we're starting to see less of her wearing contemporary styles and trends. The fascination with her death is starting to get a little less eroticized and more realistic. Uh, statues like this one by an American artist show Cleopatra in distress and really capture the emotions that she must have been feeling. She wears a snake bangle, a reference to the decision that she will make at the end of this. But romanticism is where we really start to see Cleopatra as an Egyptian woman, and the scenes in which she is painted are less Western. So for example, this painting of Cleopatra coming out of the carpet, um, this is the painting that I was alluding to at the beginning of the video. In the background of the painting, the walls are covered in hieroglyphs and drawings, and the architecture is made to look very Egyptian. Uh, the dedicated Caesar is hard at work, and Cleopatra is wearing very little uh, sheer fabric. And this work is, again, based on a mistranslation of Plutarch, 
it wasn't actually a carpet, but you gotta admit, the carpet is a little bit more, a little more dramatic. This particular painting, titled Cleopatra Testing Poisons on Condemned Prisoners, sees Cleopatra imagined in a very non-Western setting, sitting on animal furs and accompanied by a leopard. I don't know why, but the leopard looks like it was like green screened into me. I don't know if anybody relates to that, but it just looks like this leopard was edited in. But anyway, <laughs> the painting also depicts the queen as being brutal and associated with death and violence, again, the poisons of the Nile, and perhaps it is meant to foreshadow her own death by uh, mentioning the poisons. And then this painting depicts Cleopatra among her exuberance. The animal skin, as seen in several romantic paintings, is one way of making her look exotic and different. Here she sports, oh my god, can you guys hear that cough? They always do this. Here she's with a bored expression and a relaxed posture while Antony looks on in awe. The artist draws focus to Antony by framing his face on the roof of Cleopatra's boat and it's clear that he is immediately enraptured. As seen in this British painting, Cleopatra's death remains a subject of fascination and eroticism. Here Cleopatra is laid out and posed as the asp clamps down on her breast and her expression and body language, as well as her sheer clothing, suggest an element of sensuality at work despite this being the moment of her demise. But this transition to seeing Cleopatra as an Egyptian woman does mean that we're starting to see how race and ethnicity impact people's understanding of Cleopatra. Already in the previous image, we can see there was clearly a lot of Orientalism that manifests in her being even more sexualized. The animal furs and the bright colors and the non-Western clothing are used as props to make her look more desirable. We see this especially as we move into the modern era. Not only is she being viewed as sexual because she's a woman, she's being viewed as sexual because she is an Eastern woman. Stereotypes about promiscuity in non-Western cultures are still very prevalent in today's age, and by tracking the way Cleopatra is portrayed through time, we start to see the rise in those stereotypes. The same eroticism that we saw associated with Cleopatra in the Romantic period and the Renaissance period is still present, but now it's being associated with plumes of incense smoke and big jewelry and sheer clothing and less clothing. And perhaps this is how Octavian wanted the Romans to view Cleopatra, a woman who is inherently sexual and promiscuous because she isn't one of us. This is going to continue to be a staple of Cleopatra up until the present. Coinciding with this, really uh, contributing to and leading to this, is interest in ancient Egypt is skyrocketing in the late 1790s when Napoleon Bonaparte brings his army into Egypt to invade. While there, they discover one of the biggest discoveries as far as Egyptian history is concerned, and certainly the Western um, understanding of Egyptian history is concerned, the Rosetta Stone, which is extremely important because it is the first time we are able to see hieroglyphs and their Greek translations next to each other, meaning that Western scholars are for the first time able to kind of go <laughs> reverse engineer it and figure out how to read hieroglyphs. They're able to read Egyptian. This started something called Egyptomania, in which the mainstream was becoming more interested in Egyptian history and art and culture, and that of course had effects like bringing Cleopatra once again back into the mainstream, but reinterpreting her specifically as an Egyptian queen, really playing into that role. And it is a little bit of, a lot of the art coming out at this time did really really play into that um, different, the cultural difference with her, and that's where we see a little bit of Orientalism at work, uh, making her not only an Egyptian figure, but a very like stereotypical and eroticized Egyptian figure. But Egyptomania brought many new trends. Some of them were good, some of them were not. Uh, some good trends are the Washington Monument was made to look like an Egyptian obelisk, and the St. 
the Egyptian bridge in St. Petersburg uh, looks like this. Some of the bad trends though were a fascination with mummies taking really manifesting in really gross ways, so making mummies into paint. There's a type of paint called mummy brown, which we cannot reproduce anymore because we don't do that to mummies anymore. And also the trend of eating mummies. People used to eat them. Cannibalism. The neoclassical and romantic periods coincide with this time period, so which is why a lot of the paintings and artistic movements are taking more genuine inspiration from ancient Egypt, really like including actual hieroglyphs and actual jewelry and um, things that we find in artifacts. Another aspect of Egyptomania and the time period that we're in is that Cleopatra is starting to have genuine effects on political and social movements. So an example of this is this painting which I showed you from Juan Luna, a Filipino artist, and this is a really landmark painting in proving that Asian artists are just as capable as European artists. Luna wasn't just keeping up with his European contemporaries, he was outdoing them. As such, this painting is now on permanent exhibit at the prestigious Prada Museum in Madrid. But beyond that, the painting was done at a time where revolutionary ideology was really on the rise in the Philippines, which at the time was occupied by Spain. And so when Luna was painting Cleopatra, he was painting her as a figure who was rising against the empire and kind of by extension rising against colonialism. And this isn't a great comparison, it's not a perfect comparison, because we know that Cleopatra herself was occupying Egypt as kind of comparable to the way that Spain was occupying uh, the Philippines at the time. Cleopatra's Tol Ptolemaic dynasty was occupying Egypt. They were foreign, essentially like imperialist colon colonialists who were occupying land that was not theirs. In America, a little bit earlier than a little before Luna's time, uh, Cleopatra is becoming somewhat prominent among abolitionists and later the predecessors to the civil rights activists uh, because they're using her as an example of an African queen who is able to stand up against the Roman Empire and by extension or symbolically against Western power against centralized Western empires, kind of similar to the United States. They use Cleopatra as an argument against eugenics and white supremacy. And again, this is also not a perfect comparison because Cleopatra herself was not ethnically African. Her family lineage didn't come from Africa. But I do think my personal opinion, kind of taking a step back from the academics of it all, my personal opinion is that the amount of good that Cleopatra was able to do for these people matters, regardless of whether or not their interpretation of her was accurate. If Cleopatra was able to give people hope during times like slavery, if she was able to empower people who were enslaved, then that's important. We've been kind of skirting around the answer to our third research question. Is the depiction of Cleopatra throughout art history accurate? And I think that what we've been saying without actually saying it is that the majority of the interpretations we've seen of her are not accurate. She's always too sexual or too romantic or seemingly entirely unrelated to Cleopatra, just her name on a contemporary woman's body. It kind of seems like the Renaissance painters just wanted to have a famous name for their painting and didn't actually care that much about historical accuracy. Or maybe they had just read Shakespeare's version and thought that was good enough, but he's pretty famously not a historian. So these interpretations from Luna and from the abolitionists aren't any less accurate than the interpretations that we saw in the Renaissance. But these interpretations have genuine and measurable positive impacts on people who were in really bad situations, people who were in slavery. If Cleopatra was ever able to empower uh, people who were in such a dark place, then I think that that in itself matters. That said, if you do want a story about a ethnically African queen who defeated the Roman Empire, I will link the story of Kandake Amanurenas.
A major change came right at the turn of the 20th century. Pictures could move. Since the beginning of film, Cleopatra has been the subject of many, many major motion pictures. She is a huge Hollywood star. Her first film credit is from 1899, 18 years after Luna painted his masterpiece, and three years after the Philippine Revolution began. Since then, almost every decade has included some variation of a Cleopatra movie or a movie in which she is a character and more movies are have been made that are about or inspired by ancient Egypt and mention her in passing or not at all. And recent years are not exempt. There are two new film projects coming out about Cleopatra in this next year, or maybe they've already come out. I don't really keep up with movies. Uh, but both have been the subject of debate. I'm going to put a pin in that until we get to them chronologically, but we'll talk about the debate. The way that Cleopatra is depicted is still pretty sexual. Uh, she's still the seductress. She's the beautiful woman who entraps Caesar and later Mark Antony with her feminine wiles. Uh, she's played by silent film actress Theta Barra in a film which has mostly been lost to time, but some of the images from the film still exist. Uh, so she looked like this. And of course, with the second wave of Egyptomania in 1920, after the discovery of King Tut's tomb, it's clear that we're starting to get even more attention to detail when it comes to accurately representing Egyptian culture and Egyptian imagery. So like with this image of Thetabara, which is actually from 1917, so a little bit before second wave, uh, we see that her headdress is clearly inspired by Cleopatra's image of herself as Isis. We see actual hieroglyphs behind her in the poster, although they're probably nonsense. It's, I don't think it's a sentence or anything. And it's clear that costume designers are taking more and more inspiration from actual Egyptian artifacts. Uh, and they would have had more access to knowing about these things as in information is becoming more accessible and more widespread. And there is a lot of stylization that happens when we take the artifacts and move them to film, but the, the idea is there. The Cleopatra's iconic look is solidified in 1963 with Elizabeth Taylor's portrayal, possibly the most famous portrayal of Cleopatra. At the time, the film was the most expensive movie ever made at $300 million adjusted for inflation. The movie had over 70 unique sets, all of which were fully built. Cleopatra's barge was rumored to have started shortages of building materials in Italy, where the movie was filmed. And there were also said to have been 10,000 extras, as they could not use CGI in order to create crowds. They had to be real people. In the film, Elizabeth Taylor donned several looks, which have become indefinitely associated with the real Cleopatra, regardless of whether or not they are accurate. Uh, they include her shock blue eyeshadow, her blunt black hair, and these little her little hairstyles with the gold in them. At the time, filming was not able to happen in Egypt where they originally wanted to film because Elizabeth Taylor was Jewish and Jews were not allowed into the country. And I don't really, I have struggled to articulate what I'm about to say, but I do think it is interesting that it kind of seems like no matter where Cleopatra is, no matter which iteration of her we see, she never quite fits in. She's always somehow otherized. She just can't quite, she just can't quite find a place where she fits. And I know that of course a Jewish woman playing Cleopatra is not historically accurate as Cleopatra wasn't Jewish. But I do think it's this interesting like cosmic thread surrounding Cleopatra in which she just like can't, we just can't get it right. She never quite fits. Moving into the modern day, Cleopatra remains a very popular character in all kinds of media, including art, movies, plays, dramas, video games, etc, etc, songs. She's pretty consistently depicted now. She's had a couple centuries to really solidify her look, but she usually has very dark, blunt black hair, uh, usually kind of a 
white dress with blue and gold accents. Even today, her sexuality and promiscuity remain to be large focal points of Cleopatra, and she's still portrayed as a seductress and sexually liberated woman, even though modern feminists kind of interpret this with a little bit more um, empathy. Some feminist ideologies embrace her sexuality as a rejection of the patriarchal views at the time and an empowering moment for her, but others argue that the conversation of her sexuality really shouldn't be included in discussion of her because its origins are in Octavian's smear campaign, and we have really very little evidence to prove that she ever was the person that he said he was. she was. No matter whether or not modern people view her sexuality as empowering, the origin, the roots of that depiction of her is misogynistic and is patriarchal and was violent, really. It was meant to incite violence against her. So I don't know that it is productive to spin this story as if her sexuality is something of empowerment and self-liberation when it was meant to destroy her. There are plenty of modern or even semi-modern figures who embrace sexuality and beauty and self-love in empowering and genuinely empowering ways, but there's just really not any proof that she ever was this way. Um, but we do have proof that she was multilingual, very learned, and embracing of her people and a very strategic politician. So I think I've made my stance a little bit clear on that debate, that I think that the conversation about Cleopatra has been so focused on the way that she looks for centuries, and that is not the most important thing about anybody. The way you look is not who you are. There's so much more than, to Cleopatra than just how pretty she was. And still, the portrayal of Cleopatra as very sexual is still largely negative. Uh, she appears in some recent video games, including Assassin's Creed and the video game version of Dante's Inferno, kind of a full circle moment for her. In Assassin's Creed, she orders assassins after admirers who slight her, and this portrayal was recently slammed by many classicists in a Polygon article that I'll put up on the screen for you guys, in which they mention that Cleopatra was likely not nearly as promiscuous as the game would have you believe, and that the majority of how we think of Cleopatra comes from the Roman smear campaign, the Roman propaganda against her. The video game version of Dante's Inferno takes Cleopatra's damnation to a new extreme by making her one of the game's mini-bosses. She is essentially the incarnation of lust and she is the final a thing that you have to defeat in the second circle. As the player attacks her, she becomes more grotesque and large until she is defeated and she looks monstrous. This image is a promotional still for the game and I think it's just really gross and nasty. It's a very grotesque and like openly disgusting way of comp of portraying her. What bothers me most though is seeing this thread of people's fascination with Cleopatra's death now take an active turn, the player is actively contributing to Cleopatra's death, is actively the person who is killing her, and to me this really comes across, having watched the gameplay, it really comes across as a revenge fantasy or a violent fantasy, some kind of fantasy violence against Cleopatra and really just against women. On a little bit of a lighter note, Cleopatra is one of the main muses for the doll line and eventually TV series, movie series, Monster High. The character Cleo de Nile is a mummy character who is not, I don't think that she is related to Cleopatra, I think we just picked that name, but she is one of the monsters attending Monster High. She is a mummy and yeah, that's it. She's kind of, uh, she's kind of got a mean girl attitude, very like pretty mean girl teen drama kind of thing, but it is very lighthearted. It is intended for children. Kind of similarly, Cleopatra is also a character on the cartoon TV series Clone High, in which a clone of Cleopatra is a character. She also kind of has the mean girl, pretty girl, flirty girl energy, but again, it's intended for children, so any kind of um, sexual innuendo is played as a joke, and it's not really that serious. Both of these characters are definitely inspired by Cleopatra's now iconic look, the very dark, straight, blunt hair, 
Um, Cleo from Monster High has the mummy bandages wrapped up around her, but she's also got that turquoise or blue color that we often see with Cleopatra. And Cleopatra in Clone High has more of a modern, early 2000s kind of modern girl look. Definitely taking the now iconic imagery associated with Cleopatra and making it modern, making it fun for a young audience. And Cleopatra is the artistic muse for Katy Perry's uh, Dark Horse music video, which features Katy wearing brightly colored clothes and wielding Egyptian iconography. I remember when this video came out, I think I was in middle school, uh, and she, she did get slammed for cultural appropriation and insensitivity. Uh, however, this look is much less sexualized than a lot of other portrayals, and it looks more like it's meant to be a fun artistic decision rather than a genuine homage to Cleopatra. Uh, the bright, childish color palette makes the video lively and energetic, not sensual. Uh, the video features many different costumes, some of which look to be inspired by Eliza Taylor's version. And although this look is definitely not accurate and certainly a bit culturally insensitive, as it does use Egyptian iconography without really seeming to understand them or embrace or respect the culture, the silver lining here is that Cleopatra is being represented in a way that is not associated with her gender or sexuality, it's just for fun. Cleopatra has also become a popular Halloween costume for children as well as adults. The children's costumes obviously are very um, non-sexualized, but adult costumes kind of range. Usually the costumes consist of some sort of white dress or skirt, a blue cape, gold jewelry, and a headpiece, sometimes accompanied by a black wig. These costumes are falling out of favor though because of conversation about cultural insensitivity and cultural appropriation being more uh, mainstream and more talked about. The claim of cultural insensitivity or cultural appropriation when it comes to Cleopatra is a little bit complicated because again, she herself is not ethnically Egyptian and she's also not not Egyptian though. She does make an effort to embrace the culture and to learn the language and really puts herself out there in a way that the other Ptolemaic rulers did not. So essentially, even though she was not genetically Egyptian, she did make an effort to make herself culturally Egyptian. Um, I've definitely seen some posts about how like, it's okay to dress as Cleopatra because Cleopatra herself was culturally appropriating the Egyptians. I don't know that that's true if she was making a genuine effort to embrace a, a country in which she was born. Um, but it is, it is definitely an argument to be made. The most recent Cleo news is not even out yet. Cleo, a Cleopatra documentary by Netflix and Cleopatra Film have started controversy surrounding, uh, once again, talking about Cleopatra's appearance. And I don't want to spend too long on this because honestly, it annoys me. Cleopatra didn't look like either of these women. She wasn't Sub-Saharan African, she wasn't Jewish. But honestly, more important than that, I think, is the fact that the conversation of inserting modern racial identities, the modern concept of race, to an ancient person is just not worthwhile. The idea of race that we have currently, right now, was different 100 years ago or 200 years ago. So how different do you think it was 2,000 years ago? And it's, it's just very exhausting and annoying to constantly see people arguing over Cleopatra's exact skin tone when our ideas of, I'm so sorry about the cops, when our concept of race is extremely specific to our current political environment and current time period. When Americans used to have slurs for Irish people and Italian people, and there was a holocaust against white European Jews. Clearly the concept of race is something that evolves and changes over time and it's just not it's just not an effective use of time to pretend that we can apply something so specific to our current moment to Cleopatra who was 2000 years ago. And to be completely honest, I've seen a lot of posts that claim Cleopatra as a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman with so much viciousness and ferocity 
that it really comes across as sounding more like a dog whistle than a genuine attempt to be historically accurate. And maybe those posts are well-intentioned, but it doesn't come across that way. We just don't know the exact color of Cleopatra's skin, and we can guess and argue all we want and it will bring us no closer to the answer, because we, there's a lot of factors, but first of all, Greece, Egypt, and Rome were not ethnically homogenous, and there was a lot of war and conquering of lands and rising against other lands, so there was a lot of mixing during this rough time period. A hundred years before Alexander the Great conquered um, the Persian Empire, Macedonia was part of the Persian Empire. As I've seen a lot of posts like, oh, Romans looked like this, Greek people looked like this, the really boring answer is that they looked like a lot of things. They were big empires. This is a map of Rome as its height. It would be impossible to pin down one way that everybody looked. To Romans especially, the way that you look does not matter as much as being Roman. Romanness is what they're looking for. Anyone who isn't Roman is lesser and you know, we can invade. But anyone who is Roman, regardless of how they look, is Roman. And really we don't know that much about Cleopatra's lineage. We know that Ptolemy was born in Macedon and his parents were born in Macedon, but beyond that, nothing. And again, a hundred years earlier, Macedonia was Persia, so it is possible that somewhere along the line his family moved from elsewhere and came to Macedon. That's, that's really very much within the realm of possibility. So the long and short of it is, applying modern racial ideas to an ancient time is just not productive. And also, even if we could, they wouldn't apply to Cleopatra because they didn't exist back then, and we still don't know exactly which race she was, even by modern standards. So if I, if I see a single comment about what ethnicity Cleopatra was, you're blocked. And I think what's more important than Cleopatra's racial identity, because it shouldn't matter that much, it shouldn't be the only thing that people talk about, what matters more than that is the fact that she was treated as a foreigner and as a cultural outsider by the Roman Empire, uh, who valued Romanness above anything else. And many people of marginalized identities today can relate to that feeling of being a cultural outsider, of, of xenophobia essentially, uh, and can find empowerment and empathy and solace within Cleopatra, even if they're not exact comparisons. So we've reached the end of the video, and you're noticing there's still run time. We've talked about all of our research questions. We know how Cleopatra was depicted, we know how the depiction has changed, and why it has changed over time, and we know whether or not those depictions were accurate. So it's time to unveil the secret fourth question. Does it matter? So most of the depictions of Cleopatra are not accurate. Does it matter? On the one hand, yes, of course it does. Cleopatra was real and deserves to be remembered as accurately as we can. So much time has passed and so many stories have been spun about her that misinformation is taken as true. If her legacy is all that remains of her, then she is her legacy. And I think it's really important to remember that in Greek and Egyptian culture, death and the way that you're remembered after death is extremely important. And in Egypt, it's important to the way that you experience the afterlife. And in Greece, really, your legacy is your afterlife. And I imagine that in a time period where very few people can read and where death can come very quickly and very suddenly, like we saw with Alexander the Great at the very beginning of this video, the stories that people pass down about you, the way that people talk about you and remember you, is who you are. The random people, the citizens of Rome and Egypt can't read the historical records to know who Cleopatra was. They can't read at all. So the way that people talk about her, the stories that people tell about her, are the truth to them. That is the truth. They have no way of 
debating it, so that is the truth. And this is really where we see the importance of oral history in the ancient world, because most people can't debate what they hear. The way that you're talked about is who you are. And in Cleopatra's time period, people spoke horribly about her. To the citizens of Rome, Cleopatra was the person that, that Caesar Augustus said she was. And to every, it seems like every century since then, people have said really horrible things about her. Today, people say really horrible things about her. But the thing is, we live in the age of information. We can read the histories. We can look objectively at what happened and make decisions for ourselves. So don't we owe it to her to rectify what's been done to her in a smear campaign 2,000 years ago? Isn't it our responsibility as people who do have access to information and who can read to actually, you know, make that choice to be accurate? And if we can be accurate, if we have the ability and the information to be accurate, why wouldn't we be? So yes, it does matter. But physical appearance is not who a person is. And it really bothers me that anytime there's any kind of news about Cleopatra, the way that she looks dominates the conversation, whether it is a conversation about her racial identity or whether or not she was pretty that, that's all that people seem to want to talk about is her physical appearance. <laughs> There's so much more to a person than that, and certainly more to Cleopatra. And of course I see and I understand the desire to apply Cleopatra to the modern world, to show her as an example of feminism or anything like that, but it's just a difficult thing to do when she lived in such a different time period. You're never going to have a perfect one-to-one -one comparison between Cleopatra and a modern, uh, any kind of modern conflict. The question becomes, how do we portray Cleopatra if we don't focus at all on appearance? Because casting directors have to know who to cast, and artists have to know how to draw her, how to color her, but I just, I really wish that we didn't have to focus so much on appearance, since it is something that we just cannot know. Maybe one day we'll find her remains and we will know for certain and then we will know exactly who to cast, but until then, I don't think that her appearance needs to be the most important thing about her. Maybe she was really beautiful, like Liza Taylor, or maybe she was horrible to look at. So her parents are probably full-blooded siblings. Personally, and this is a very unacademic and honestly selfish opinion, but I hope that we never find Cleopatra's remains. The world has been so obsessed with her body since she was alive, and I hope that it's never touched again. I think she deserves that rest. Uh, thank you for watching. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, here's a kiss on the cheek. Please like, comment, and subscribe because this took me forever. So I hope to see you in the next one and see ya!